The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Keep, we pray you, O Lord, your church with your perpetual mercy, and because without you we cannot but fall, keep us ever by your help from all things hurtful, and lead us to all things profit profitable to our salvation. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Bless we the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Well, welcome to this Sunday in which we look at the propers for 20B. Uh, I'm going to be presenting to you a lesson from James chapter 3, verse 13, to chapter 4, verse 10, a long uh, text. Um, and I want to remark that it fits very nicely with the gospel lesson, which is from Mark 9, 30 to 37. If you look at that text very briefly, and perhaps this is what you're going to preach on. And as you know, we always recommend that you preach on the gospel. Uh, this is where Jesus foretells his, his death and resurrection. And then also the, the notion of who is the greatest. And I think it's in that notion right there, who is the greatest in the kingdom, and coming to him as a child, the language of first and last and servant of all. I think that really fits our epistle lesson for today, because as, <clears throat> as many of you know, from the good Dr. Scare in his book, James the Apostle of Faith, um, he's very explicit, Dr. Scare is, uh, about how these texts have to do with the pastoral office, and that we're really speaking here about the life of the pastor. And in the context here of James, you can see that we've just seen that really very sort of disturbing moment in this little epistle where he talks about the, the tongue uh, as a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among its members. And I think if we think about that tongue as being the tongue of the preacher who is preaching uh, against the, the, the Word of God, against the gospel, who is preaching a doctrine that does not reflect the biblical confession of faith, then I think we can see how it is that, that the, the passage we're about to look at has everything to do with the pastoral office. So if we come and take a look here at the text, we're going to see here that the text um, is, is really, in a sense, uh, framed by imperatives. And you can see I put them here in the yellow, you know. And as you get to the end of the text here, um, you'll see that we end with a series of imperatives. You can see how many there are here at the very end. And I think they're, they're, they're uh, significant, especially in the way in which they pound here in verses 7, 8, 9, and 10. With number 10, uh, verse 10 here, as being perhaps the great gospel moment in the text. Now, in, in a way, there are, are going to be two parts to this text divided by the, the, the chapter. Uh, verses 13 to 18, and, and, I, and I want to suggest a couple of things here. First of all, the, the great theme here of this first part is wisdom. And you can see how many, I put it in blue here, it's a gospel word. Um, th this section is defined by wisdom. And what is wisdom? Well, we know from the Gospels that wisdom is personified in Jesus and in John. And the person who is wise, uh, Dr. Scare claims, and I'm sure he's right, this is the word for epistemology. This is a unique uh, reference in the, in the New Testament. It's not used in any other place. Um, and, and you can see here wisdom, understanding, or, or a different, you know, a kind of wisdom that comes from sort of a deep, he, he described it as a scientific knowledge, but a knowledge that has uh, a studied depth to it. Here, wisdom is described as a, a word that is oftentimes used for humble. We've got the language of the truth. You don't want to lie against the truth. So wisdom is a proclamation of the truth. 
Um, you can see here that, that the person who is, is wise, the wise and sensible pastor and understanding, is the one whose good conduct, verse 13 there, lets him show forth, you know, the works, his works, in the meekness of wisdom. Now, we're talking about the proclamation of the gospel here in, in the, the proclamation of wisdom, that is Christ. But, but here is the, the opposite, bitter jealousy. You can almost, again, see sort of pharisaical behavior here. Bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts. And, and here are, are some more of the, the, the imperatives. Here it's let him show forth in his good life, you know, the, the works of his kind of humble, meek wisdom. And then um, verse uh, 14 there in the second part, he says, do not boast uh, and, and be false witnesses against the truth. Now, this, this is, a, a, I think, a part of the, the nature of the, the pastoral office that we sometimes forget that not because of our own personal wisdom, but because we bear the, the, the Christ in us and proclaim that Christ, we are looked to as people of wisdom. And the last line there, verse 15, I think is very important. Um, the, 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 he says, this is not the wisdom that comes down from above. Okay, so it's, it's not the wisdom that comes but here, here, you, here you have it, but it's earthly, it's unspiritual, it's devilish. And here is Luther's triad, sin, uh, flesh, and the devil. That, that is where the wisdom that he is railing against, this jealousy, and this wisdom that is filled with selfish ambition, th this is not the wisdom. And you can see that he's speaking here to a specific context, even though we're not sure what it is. Then what he does here, which is really quite interesting, um, he comes to a part now where he, he almost has a, kind of a catalog of of some of the vices that you might find from those who that have that kind of wisdom. Um, jealousy and selfish ambition exist. There will be disorder in every vile practice. Now, I think that's a very important point because these here certainly parallel this, but it's a fleshing out of what this triad is here. And then he turns now, I mean, here, here we're seeing wisdom again, but the wisdom that comes from above first is pure. And then you have language here that is like the fruits of the Spirit. You have, you have peace, you have the, the language here that, that reflects the, the things that, that we want, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits. Um, and then he, he counters it in sort of a chiastic form. You can see what the, here in the center is what wisdom really should be. With the ah, ah, which I think is, is a really a clever way of uh, doing it. Um, that it is uh, uh, things that are not um, I think the tr translations that is not that are impartial and sincere. And he includes now not not using the word wisdom, but talking about what happens when there's wisdom is that a fruit of righteousness in peace. This is the goal. And you can see what we're going to see from the next pericope that there's a war going on. Um, and I think, I think it's important to see how he refers to peace again by saying, 
that a harvest of righteousness is sown, spe retai, by those who make peace. And, th and this is what he's seeking. And you can see here now that, that wisdom has its goal in peace. Now, this is, this is such an important gospel word. This is, a, as I've said many, many times, this is the number one word in the liturgy. Christ, wisdom, and those who are in Christ, who preach Christ, who preach the atonement, who preach the, the wisdom from above that is pure. Notice, here's the first reference to peace. They will result in peace. And that is, that is at the heart of what preaching should be. That when people hear your preaching, what they hear is they hear peace. Okay, let's, uh, let's go now to the, to the other part of this. I don't know if I can get the whole thing in. Probably not. But that's okay. We'll look at, at part one and part two here. Um, there is a little bit of a switch here, and, and he begins to talk about uh, some of the translations. Polemai is a war. There are wars, you know, fights among you. Um, Dr. Scare goes on and on a little bit here about the dating, and as you know, he dates it before the Apostolic Council. James becomes bishop in 44. Um, and, well, I should say 42 to 44. Usually 44 is the date. And this is during a terrible persecution, the first one by Gentiles, Herod Agrippa the first. Two, eight, two Ps, I think. Anyway, it's a, a terrible persecution. And this is where James, the son of Zebedee, dies. So James is very much aware of... of kind of the, the persecution that's going on between the, the, um, the Jews and the Jewish Christians, really, and probably in Jerusalem. Um, notice that there's, there's this frame here of passions, your passions. Um, and, and I think that's a very important little frame there. And, and you, you really have two sections here. You've got this section here, even though... I think you might include these two here as well. So you've, here, here the passions are, are contrasted with the friend of the world and enemies of God. Okay, so you can see there, there are two parts to this, this first part here. Yeah, I think it's one to four, five to, five to ten. But anyway, and, and, and look at, look at, what, what the context here is, and think about the church, think about the preaching in the first century, think about the struggles that are going on in establishing a gospel within 20 years of Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension. And, you know, you, you, you wonder who his target here is when he talks about there being fights among you, that, 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 that the passions are at war within you, strateo menon, you know, they're fighting within you. You desire and you do not have. L look at how all these, there's a, there's a rhythm here. Um, so you murder um, and you covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel you do not have because you do not ask, you know. And there, there you, you can almost hear the, the Lord's Prayer. They're, they are not submitting themselves to the Lord's liturgy, you know. Uh, you ask and you do not s receive. Why, why is that? Be because, uh, because you ask in the wrong way, kakos, in order that, you know, you spend it out on your passions. Now, you know, if, if you're still thinking here in terms of the pastoral office, you can see here that there may be a war over the preaching that's going on in Jerusalem. And, you know, James was considered a bulwark. Um, he was the, the one who kind of kept the church together from 44 to 62. It's a long time to be bishop of a contentious place. You know, and I mean, he's got, he's got the pagans, the Romans, 
He's got the Jews and the temple and all the persecution that's going to come along with that. Those are the first earliest persecution. And then he's got these Jewish Christians who are being persecuted by both. And so he's, he's, he's got a cauldron. And, and I think in many ways this, this letter may have been written right after he becomes Bishop of Jerusalem. And then he says something here that is, that is really kind of harsh. And it, I think it has to do with apostasy. Um, oftentimes it's simply translated, you adulterous people, you unfaithful ones. Um, and listen to what he says. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Um, uh, therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy with God. And you wonder if the pressure here on the Jewish Christians is such that they are, are, are ready to return to their Jewishness or they're ready to play ball with the Romans. I mean, if you think of our context, I mean, we have a secular world that is just bearing down upon us. And maybe we just don't trust God enough, you know, to, to, to ask what we need and, and to, to, to have what we need in order to fight these these passions that are not just ruling in the culture, but ruling in us because of the culture, you know, and being a friend of the world is a very easy thing to do in this day and age because it is so difficult to be a Christian. That leads us to the last part of this text. And I think here you can see that he, he really kind of turns it now, quoting scripture, and we're not sure exactly where this is from, Dr. Scare makes a very important point here that the Spirit here is the Holy Spirit fighting against the devil in us. And, and here, I, if, if I were preaching this text, I would preach on this, the humility that is given to us as grace. And then this language here, you know, humble, exalted, he who humbles himself before the Lord will be exalted. This is clearly Christological language. This is the Christ in us who is allowing us to be able to preach this, this Christological humility, not one that is kind of brought on by a, a false sort of outward humility, but one that, that submits itself to preaching the cross, to preaching the atonement, that centers itself in the wisdom that we saw before, that centers itself in Christ, you know, that allows itself to be the last and not the first, as it says in the, in the gospel lesson, to be like a child, you know? And, you know, if you want to preach this text in the atonement, preach it through the passion and resurrection prediction that comes from Mark 9. In between these two statements of humility, you have all these imperatives, you know, and you can hear them, you know, kind of, kind of banging. It's, it's wonderful, you know, rhetoric. Submit yourselves, therefore, before God. Resist the devil, and that's the spirit that's groaning within you, you know. Um, uh, draw near to God, he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinner. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Such an important word here, double-minded, you know. That's, that's what they are. They're, they're caught between being enemies of God and being, you know, um, friends to the world. So they're, 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 it, it's the word that brings us into, into hypocrisy. And then he, then he tells them this really, you know, uh, um, th these, these imperatives here that are so, you know, kind of almost tragic. Not there. These ones here, you know. Um, and, and it, 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 there's that, that one kind of let in the middle of it, which is so important, you know, uh, let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into gloom, you know, and it, it, maybe they're rejoicing too much in their cooperation with the world. And he is calling them to humility. He's calling them to the cross. He's calling them to the atonement. He's calling them to wisdom. I mean, there's so much here. 
And there, there is, I think, a, a way in which you can use this text as an illustration in the first century of some of the issues that Mark 9 would have brought forward. And so I commend this to you as a, a part of your sermon on Mark 9 in which you can really lay out for people what it was like in that first century and what it's like today. Very similar situations as we continue to contend for the faith.